be with you all. You are a treasure people of the Lord. Keep the words of the Lord in your heart. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you were at home, when you were away, when you lie down and you pray at night. For one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Let us pray. God of all mercy, by your power to heal and to forgive, graciously cleanse us from all sin and make us strong. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Perishable. 
What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Here is the reading of the second lesson. Please rise for the reading of God. <coughs> Not so we can do the funeral service all over again. 
But we want to pray. So I have to commit that spot of the believer to God. And to say, Father, remember this body when it comes time for the resurrection of the righteous. Our hope is not just heaven. Our hope is the resurrection of the body. Now we find this laid out very, very well in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it's important that we spend some time on this. You see, the first thing that we find in 1 Corinthians 15 is that Paul is talking to the Corinthians about the thing that will get them saved. That Christ died for their sins, according to the scriptures, raised the dead, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to many, many people, including 500 others, and last of all, to Paul. And he says, so we have preached, and so you have believed. And then he goes on to say, if Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of them say that there is no resurrection from the dead? So many in the Corinthian church were quite willing to believe in heaven, but they could not believe that their own bodies would be raised from the dead at the resurrection of the righteous. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, he says, but Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So in other words, the resurrected body of Jesus is the first fruits of a whole harvest of other bodies that will raise from the dead. His resurrection is a sign for ours. Now, why is that important? Why is it important that we understand that there is a resurrection of the body? That it's not enough to believe in heaven, but the fact of the matter is that heaven is, is a, a wonderful place, but we have more waiting for us. Why is that important for us to see? Well, first of all, we need to see that the resurrection of the body is, for us, the completion of God's redemption for each individual. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for our sin, and he died to save not just our soul and our spirit, but our body. We need to remember that every human being is made in the image of God. Now, to be made in the image of God means, first of all, that you and I are made in a triune image. Just as God is one, and yet he is also Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So each one of us is one being, and yet we have within us and on us three, not independent, but distinct parts of ourselves. The soul, the spirit, and the body. And when we die in faith, the soul and the spirit goes to heaven. But what happens to the body? It gets buried. Takes enough time to turn it back into dust. Now, does God, is God only interested in redeeming your soul and your spirit, but not the body? Not the least. He says very clearly that on the last day when he comes, he's going to raise up that body, and our souls and our spirits are going to be reunited with the body. And what that means then is that God is going to complete the redemptive act that he purchased on Calvary's Hill for those who believe so that we are a totality of mind, body, and spirit, or soul, spirit, and body again. And we will be glorified in our body as Jesus was glorified in his. So one of the things we need to remember is that the resurrection of the body, ours, is an important part of God's redemptive purpose. It cannot be left out because he intends to redeem the entire image of God in us, not just two-thirds of it, all of it. That's very important. And of course, the second part that this reminds us of is that our hope is not simply heaven, but we're waiting for the creation. And we're also going to enter in to a new phase of our relationship with God, where those who are raised up with him at the resurrection of the righteous, what's it say in Revelation? We reign in life with Christ. We enter into an inheritance. And we enter into a bodily. So please understand 
The resurrection of the body has a great deal of importance for us because it means our complete redemption as well as our entering into the inheritance that God has for us once Christ returns. But now, someone might say, all right, well, pastor, that's fine, but what kind of bodies will we have? How will these resurrection bodies be different from the bodies that we have now? Will they be different? And the answer is that our model for that is the resurrected body of Jesus. There's only been one so far who is raised from the dead in this way. And so our model is the body of Jesus. And what we find in 1 Corinthians 15 is really two things that should really pique our interest. The first thing that we're told is that our resurrection body will be different than what is so. It'll be, it'll come out of it, but it'll be different. And here, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, uses an agricultural analogy. You know, you take a grain of wheat. Y'all have, y'all done wheat before, right? Y'all know what that looks like. And you take that wheat seed, you put it in the ground, till it, you put it in there. And it comes out, this beautiful golden shaft, with all these other pieces of wheat on it. And it doesn't look at all like the seed. And yet, the seed is the basis for that coming up. Or if you take an apple seed, and you put that in the ground, and you tend to eventually get this great big huge apple tree. It's glorious. And the point of the agricultural uh, analogy here is for us to understand that our bodies are sown in decay, but they raise up imperishable. They're sown in weakness, but they're raised up in power. They're sown uh, immobile, but they're, they raise up in glory. In, in other words, what, what, when we bury the body, when the resurrection comes, what, what comes out is so much more glorious and wondrous than what was buried that it is hard for us to even imagine that the best thing we can look at is the analogy of, of looking at a tree. I mean, when you look at a tree, I know I remember when I was a kid, we had these great big oak trees in New Jersey that right up. And they were, I mean, I thought they lived forever because, you know, they were centuries old. And somebody told me once when I was a kid, well, Stern's house is little acorn. I said, oh, you're pulling my leg. I cannot imagine that it starts out like that. But that's how it starts. We can't imagine that something that glorious will come out of us. But that's what God is promising. Something far more magnificent and glorious is going to come out of our bodies. By the way, just as an aside, there's no extra charge for this. But if God is going to make our bodies that glorious, then I would suggest to you that while we're here in these bodies, we need to treat our bodies a whole lot better and respect them a whole lot more than we often do. Because if we're the temple of God now, imagine what we're going to be like once He restores that temple and makes it so much more glorious than it is. We need to respect what God has given us, the seed that's going to be sown. And not poo poo what God has given us, but take care of it, honor it. Not because, not because we're trying to boast, but because God has given us something wonderful. If God considers it wonderful enough to redeem, we need to consider our bodies something <coughs> wonderful enough to take care of. That, again, the just inside, there's no less charge. But then somebody might say, all right, but what does Paul mean when he says that we're sold a natural body and raised up a spiritual body? Does that mean that we're walking around like ghosts? And that's an important question to answer, primarily because, you know, nowadays, I don't know about you, but I'm talking to these kids. And when you talk about the resurrection of the dead, you know what they're thinking about? They're thinking about zombies. Disgusting zombies. That's what they're thinking about when they're thinking about things coming up from the dead. They have these games now where you've got zombie games or what have you. It's, it's incredibly disgusting and rude. 
But the fact of the matter is the resurrection has nothing at all to do with the occult or, or anything to do with that kind of stuff. So what does it mean then when it says you're a spiritual body? Well, it doesn't mean that you're not physical. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you're a ghost. How do we know that? When you look at the body of Jesus. The body of Jesus could do certain things that our natural body cannot do. Even his natural body at that time could not do this. But after it was raised from the dead, he could do certain things that his natural body was not able to. And one thing in particular that I want to show you, which is why they thought he might be a ghost, is that you can lock the door so that a natural body can't come through that door and have people in the room and all of a sudden he just shows up at will. So the, the, the resurrection body <coughs> is not limited by the laws of physics or nature. It has supernatural power. In that sense, it's completely different than our bodies. It doesn't die, it doesn't get sick, it isn't affected by the natural laws of the creation. It is completely holy and set apart. It is pure. It is righteous. And it is completely uh, for God and with God and in the glory of God. So his body is going to be like, I mean, our body is going to be like his body. So that means that our body is going to be physical. He can be touched. He can eat. But he also could appear and disappear just like that and not be affected by the natural. That's how our resurrection bodies will be. So finally, the third question that we need to ask is, will we be recognizable? If we have a resurrection body that's different than what we had <coughs> here, will it be recognizable? The answer is yes, it will be, in certain respects. Because please take note that when Jesus rose from the dead, his body came out of the grave. Okay? What that means then is that the body that was sown is still used. It's just glorified. And when he showed himself to the disciples, what did he do? He showed them his hands and his feet. Why? Because that's where the stars were. He was recognizable to be the crucified Lord. And so we too will have aspects of ourselves that are recognizable. People will know who we are. And at the same time, our bodies will be so changed and so glorified that it will also be quite different in the sense that our bodies will do things and be in a condition that has never been in before so that you have both a recognizability and at the same time a new body. Something different than you ever expected. Because it, it, it is, it's a supernatural body. So today, let's remember that the resurrection of the body for Jesus is not optional. He was raised from the dead. And his physical resurrection speaks to our resurrection. And therefore, to speak of the resurrection of our bodies is also not optional. It's the truth. It's part of our Christian hope. So when we think about our hope and the reality of that hope, we never forget that our hope includes heaven. Praise God for that. But it doesn't end there. Our hope includes the resurrection of the body. Our hope includes entering into that, that inheritance that the Father purchased for us through the blood of His Son, so that we live <coughs> with Him. And our hope includes a new creation that will come, where we will all be with Christ, and in a world, and in a heaven, without sin, without death, and without death. It's a glorious, glorious hope and future. Let's cling to that, and let's share that with others. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you that we can expect the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Lord, we pray that as we do the work of the kingdom here, 
that we would share our hope and that our hope not mean simply going to heaven, although I hate to use the word simply because that's so much more awesome than what we have here. But there's more. There's a resurrection of the body that we all are looking forward to. And it's not optional. It's, it's part and parcel of what you purpose for us. So thank you. Lord, help us share that hope. And Lord, by your Holy Spirit, make people alive to that hope in Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing our next hymn. Also in the Luther Book of Worship, that is 543.
Pour out all the gifts of the Spirit of Rover into our places in the body of Christ. And grow with us all the fruits of the Spirit, Lord, that joined together people will see the light of salvation that is in us and turn to you and live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord Jesus, you've commanded us to pray for our nation. And so we pray your salvation on our president, the vice president, the Senate, the House, the Supreme Court, our governor, state legislators, state, local, and federal officials and judges. Lord, where they're right and sustainable, where they're wrong, grant the spirit of grace and supplication to recognize their wrongs. Born over their sin as for an only son, throw all their iniquities, decrees into the fire, and burn up forever, and establish policies that are pleasing in your sight for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, we pray too that you would forgive our nation for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Forgive us, Lord, for our idolatry and worshiping men and gods and not honoring you as Lord of all. Forgive us, Lord, for the shedding of innocent blood. Forgive us, Lord, for abortions. Forgive us, Lord, uh, for uh, seeking our own way and not your way. Forgive us, Lord, uh, for bitterness, rage, anger, hate, jealousy, unforgiveness, and unbelief. Forgive us, Lord, for uh, the lies that we have uh, listened to and pushed uh, into our schools so that our, our children uh, don't know what the truth is but are confused. Lord, forgive us. Forgive our nation. Lord, forgive us for rejecting the order of creation and rejecting marriage as you established it, rejecting male and female. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, cleanse us, and by your Holy Spirit, bring a, a Holy Spirit awakening to our nation. Let it begin in the church and burn out the root branch of compromise of sin within the church so that we would shine like the sun and that through your church, you would grant us the grace to preach your word of power while you lift up your hand to heal with miracles, wonders, and signs of ten. Lord, bring the Holy Spirit awakening and revival to our nation that as a nation we can get on our knees in true repentance and turn to you and live. Lord, set the truth in the light that it cannot be denied. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, you commanded us to pray for the people of Israel, and so we pray your peace and righteousness to Jerusalem. Let now be the time for you when they recognize you, the one that they pierce, mourn over you as for a lonely son, that they be cleansed by your blood, filled with your spirit, join to your church as the one new man. Lord, we pray for your congregations there in Israel as well, that you grant them the grace to preach your word with power while you lift up your hand to heal with miracles, wonders, and signs. Uh, and Lord, I, I pray too. Uh, Lord, that as there are many Israelis who are now coming to you because of visions and dreams that they're having, where you are making yourself known, yes, Lord, let that continue and grow, and save your people, the remnant of Israel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. Lord Jesus, you are the healer by your stripes. We're healed. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the many people in our congregations who have been healed by your by your uh, spirit, by your power, by your word. We're grateful that you are the covenant God who keeps the covenant and does as you say. You are the awesome God who has been worshipped and praised and glorified. We just thank you that we can trust you and know that you are faithful and true. And so, Lord, we come before your presence to ask the healing that you purchase on Calvary's Hill, knowing that your word is true, that you have said that when we pray in faith, the prayer of faith will raise them up. The Lord will make them well. So, Lord, we pray for the healing that you purchase on Calvary's Hill. And to Roger Rollis, Aspen Heisler, Ed Worm, J. Dillard Van Sweet, Bryce Johnson, Robert M. Pete, Jerry Rosecrans, Betty Vesterson, Janine Westby, Marilyn Horston, Bruce Tilts, Helen Beck, Doug Sorry, Oliver Sorry, Kathy Schaefer, Douglas Hurston, Ruben Kahara, Monica Parks, Dorothy Johnson, Gianna Kapar, Perry James Lovell, Joe Freitag, Carolyn Resendez, Josie Yuki, Norman Vanderpam, Doug Hasselton, Laurel Harrison, Rose Winkler, Sam Koenig, Creole Lundquist, Jalen Johnson, Joanne Lou Mendoza, Gordon Cowan, Stephanie Hoisted, Ruby Overhold, uh, Palmer Lindlaw, Scott Russo, Stephanie Bonell. We pray too for our military personnel, Michael Rasmussen, Shane Kendall, Patrick O'Malley, Kaylin Dyer, Kevin and Elias McKenzie, Scott, Mark Riley, Trevor Simmons, Jonathan Defoe, Isaiah Burke, David Burke, Sammy Neese, Riley Legacy, and Harvey Hagman. 
And we pray your blessings on all those we mention now, either out loud or in our hearts. Ken McCormick. Pray. Stanley Brown. Pray for brothers and sisters at Gilgit. Yes. Also for Andreas Zanstrand. Yes. We'll pray for the, those families of that hockey team killed here yesterday in Saskatchewan. Yes. Lord, pray yes. for them, that tragedy. Yes. Thank you. Joyce Yes, Lord. Lord, ask your blessing on the uh, dinner that the uh, congregation is going to have there tomorrow. And I pray for joy in that working together and uh, the ladies coming together and all that serve in that. Uh, yes. We give, give glory to you in, in that, Lord. Praise yes. God. Thank you. Lord, I also pray that you just add to that help uh, those who have come and, and receive uh, that meal, receive fellowship. Uh, Lord, that this would be a time of awakening too, for people to come to that fellowship and, and know their need of you and, and, and know their need to be in a, in a congregation. Lord, yes. I just pray that you would bless them in that. Yes. Praise God. Thank you. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Also Amen. with you. Let's share that peace of Lord.
of the Holy Spirit, is spreading the Jesus Christ. Glory to Christ, give the people. Amen. Glory to Christ, give the Amen.